Hello everyone, this is Umair Qureshi from Pakistan ASCD. Once again, we are with you for the second, with the second episode of I Talk Live. The one and only I Talk Live is a collaboration of ELASCD and Pakistan ASCD. And we are here with an awesome guest with us. And uh, tell me over to you. Thanks, Umair. Hi, everyone. I'm Tammy Mitiowski. Uh, it's good to be back for our second episode. Um, and today we have a special guest, Jennifer Orr. Um, she is a teacher in Virginia. She's going to talk a little bit about her role and uh, her involvement in ASC. So go ahead, Jen, take it away. Thank you, Tammy. Thank you, Umair. Um, I've been a teacher for a number of years and ASCD has, has been a part of my career from very early on. It was one of those organizations that my principal suggested was a good match and I immediately started getting involved with and um, ELASCD has been an amazing opportunity to work with people, uh, obviously around the world, <laughs> to be with you, Tammy, <laughs> and to work with people and in so many different places and to, to work with true teacher leaders, people who um, have been educators for a while and who are truly stepping up and finding new ways to lead within the profession um, has been a really exciting thing. And it's been an opportunity for me to learn from some brilliant, thoughtful, generous educators. Thanks, Jen. Um, I can't remember if last time in our broadcast, if I mentioned that um, being a member of the Emerging Leader Alumni Affiliate. Uh, I'm in the role of the president and Jen is a member at large. She's on the board as well. So it's been really great in this last, um, I guess, nine, 10 months where we've been working together and putting the affiliate together. Um, it's been really awesome working with you. Um, so that's been a great opportunity for me as well. Um, so today we're talking about uh, the facets of teacher leadership, of which there are so very many. Um, and so Umer and I have put together some questions for you um, that we wanted to chat with you about so that um, other people can learn from you, as can we. So um, is it all right if we just dive right in? First, first question, all right. Um, so as I mentioned, teacher leadership is a really huge topic and can be defined in different ways by people and looks differently for different people in different roles. So can you just talk about a little bit about what defines a teacher leader to you and what that looks like for you in your school building? Sure. And I am in complete agreement with you about how broad a term it is and how it can work in many ways. Um, I think one of the things that's critical to me is that a teacher leader is someone who is going beyond their own classroom, who is involved in education um, in some way outside of their classroom. And that may be within the building in a leadership role to support other teachers in that building or to offer other opportunities outside of the classroom to students. It can go into the district to offer PD opportunities in the district to serve on policy committees in the district. It can be at the state level. Um, it can be through organizations like ELASCD or Pakistan ASCD or ASCD opportunities to, to lead in the way of presenting at conferences or publishing articles or um, serving on committees to help form um, the way things move forward. So, I think it's such a broad term, it applies to so many people and, and many may not even really think of themselves as teacher leaders in spite of the work that they're doing beyond their classroom. Um, for me, it's involved um, a bunch of different things and it started by having an administrator who encouraged me to do things beyond my classroom, to present at conferences, to do professional development within my district, um, to serve on our school steering committee and, and help plan um, policy within our building. Uh, having someone in that formal leadership position encouraging my informal leadership early in my career was a huge boost that I, I know many teachers aren't lucky enough to get. Yeah, yeah, that's so true. Um, so you talked a little bit about um, your journey as well and how you've kind of had that support moving into the teacher leadership role. Can you talk a little bit about um, 
so you mentioned presenting. I know you do some writing because I read your blog all the time when you do posts. So can you talk about how those kinds of things uh, play a role in developing uh, your, yourself as a leader and how that works to support other people? One of the things I think it does is stepping outside of, of my day-to-day -day classroom, which I'll be totally honest, is a big enough job for anyone. <laughs> um, I, I would never say to a teacher that you need to be doing things beyond that. Um, if that isn't something that's calling to you because I recognize that the job of a teacher is at least a full-time job, if not more. <laughs> and um, But what, what those things have done for me, conference presentations, writing, either blogging or, or articles or things, I, I do those in some ways because it helps me to grow. I begin to better understand what I believe as a teacher, um, who I am as a teacher, and what that means for my students and for myself. Um, I think that's why I started doing it. What I didn't realize that's been a huge thing for me is how much stepping out of the classroom and getting involved in conference presentations or writing online has connected me to educators across the country and around the world. And the network of people from whom I get to learn now is so much broader than it was when I began teaching. Um, and that to me is such a benefit to teaching in the time that we teach that wasn't, that didn't exist when we were students. Um, and that opportunity to sit here and talk to, you know, people <laughs> in Singapore and Pakistan, at, that could be done. And what a great thing that is to share our expertise and, and question each other and, and learn together. Yeah, I so very much agree. Um, one of the things that I like about um, your blog in particular, when you do your posts, I just, it reminds me of me so much. And it's, it's a comfort to know that there's so many educators just with the same way of thinking, the same feelings, the same like, oh man, that was terrible today. But, you know, as long as people are learning and I'm reflecting about it, I think that that's really, really important. Um, so thank you for writing your blog because I like being able to connect <laughs> myself to someone else and not feel yeah. alone. Yeah, um, yeah, yeah, it's so, really So I, I would like to add one thing, Tammy. Uh, you know, the, she she has spoken wonderful and she is doing wonderful. And you, you Jenny, you are doing wonderful job actually. You know, talking about uh, uh, teacher collaboration uh, across the globe, is really really a, a big buzzing thing to these days and everyone is trying for that and that's a good sign i mean we we expect so don't uh, we don't expect so many things but at the end we, we land to the same um area so my question is like you are you are working fantastic as a teacher leader so when we talk about more data is good data how you look at this phrase uh, as a teacher leader that's a great question. And data is one of those buzzwords in education at this point that's got so many different meanings to so many different people that I almost always feel like we have to step back and, and talk about, well, when we say data, what do we mean? And that idea of more data is, is better data. Um, I, I'm definitely on board with more data. My feeling, honestly, is that too often the data is data that's coming from outside of the classroom. and it's data being handed to the teacher. And we as teachers are surrounded by data. And it's simply not, I think, sometimes what teachers recognize as data. But we know more about our students than anyone else can possibly know, uh, other than their families. <laughs> but yeah. within, yeah. within yeah. the educational system, those people in the classroom know those kids. And they have a ton of data on those kids. And we need to do better to figure out how to have teachers share their data together and look at that data alongside the data that's coming from standardized tests or from um, outside observations or whatever, wherever else we're getting that information. But we need to be prioritizing and valuing the data that teachers are generating on a daily basis with their students as much as we do other data. That's great. So uh, what I could understand from this, uh, this explanation that more data is, yeah, good data, but the source is very important. If it is coming from external source, it's not that good data. 
If it's coming from real science, it's a wonderful data. So the thing is that you know the teachers burn out due to those uh, those data, that data which is actually imposed from outside. As a teacher leader, what do you think of? Uh, I mean, people are watching us, and they they must uh, be able to understand what you suggest, and they would like to know more about it. How to deal with such kind of influence from external side? Um, whew, I think this is my 21st year in the classroom, and I've come to recognize that the job is a lot harder now than it was when I started 21 years ago. And it wasn't an easy job then. Teaching, I don't think, has ever been an easy job. Um, but I think it, it is getting more and more challenging. And in some ways, the challenges are because we're trying to do better by students. So some of those challenges come into trying to do a better job of meeting individual needs or do a better job of collaborating as teachers. And that all of that is time consuming, um, but benefits students. Some of what makes the job harder are those things that are imposed from outside. And they do, they, it can beat teachers down, um, especially if you teach in a school that tends to not be successful on those metrics. Um, I have always taught in schools that tend to not show up well when it comes to test scores. And um, I, I just start with an administrator who was able to help me see beyond that data and recognize the things that were going well. Um, and I think those of us with some experience, be it people in formal, lead formal leadership positions like principals and assistant principals and or those of us in the classroom who've been doing this for a while and who can recognize that's what this data is telling you, but let's also look at what else do you know about what you're doing in the classroom and what your students are doing. Mm -hmm. In order to keep a balance, um, I, I have, I've watched young teachers walk out of meetings when we've looked at testing data, wanting to cry. Um, phenomenal teachers, <laughs> far better than I was in my first five years. Um, and. And they need, they need someone who can help them just take a little perspective on that data because they are given a message again and again that that is yeah. such a huge thing and they need it yeah. to be balanced with all the other pieces. Um, yeah. I'm lucky to work with coaches in literacy and math who are able to step back and show us, yes, this says this and we need to do these things, but I've also been in your classroom and I've seen this and this and this and this and your students are doing this. Um, and without someone to help younger teachers, newer teachers, maybe even more experienced sometimes, see that perspective, they are, they're going to end up walking away because it's just too much. That's great. So we shift the discussion to another paradigm, you know, as a teacher leader, when you are dealing with the, with the people at your organization in your schools, and, uh, you know, there are multiple kinds of people. Some people have the rift, some people are not happy with each other how you garnish the professional relationships among the teachers as a teacher leader and what do you suggest how to do that? <laughs> yes, tell, I would like to know. <laughs> I think we all need help in this area. Wherever yeah. we are. <laughs> I love a magic answer to this. I've worked, you know, I've taught um, five different grade levels in two different schools in my years. So I've worked with a bunch of different colleagues um, on grade level teams as well as in special education and, and for our second language learner, well, our English language learners. And um, sometimes it's wonderful. Um, I am blessed right now to, to work closely with a, an ESOL teacher and a special education teacher who I could not do better than, um, which makes it really easy. Um, that has not always been true. <laughs> there have been the years where, um, where I don't trust colleagues or I don't respect colleagues. Um, and if you can't trust someone else who's working with students, um, whether they're students you feel like are yours too, you know, when I co-teach with someone and I don't trust them and I know that's my, those are my students, they're helping <laughs> or hurting. <Not>. Right? <laughs> or even if it's simply a teacher down the hall um, and those are all our kids in that building that we're all trying to, to support and lift. Um, if there's a lack of trust or a lack of respect, um, it's very, very difficult to have any kind of meaningful collaboration. And um, there are a lot of things one that, that teams can do to step back and try to build that. I think the greatest challenge 
isn't the lack of trust and respect. It's the lack of time to address it. Um, yeah. For let's imagine, you know, imagine on a, a team in which we're feeling this kind of pushback and we're feeling at odds with each other. We need time to step back and get to know each other a little bit. We need to kind of delve into our educational philosophies and share with each other what we believe and why we believe it and begin to understand where we're all coming from. But where do we do that in the midst of, but we actually also need to talk about what's happening in math and literacy in the next two weeks. Um, in some ways, I think that that push of the pacing of the school year always slows us down from addressing those bigger questions and bigger issues when it's the same with, with in, a, in a classroom if there are problems with student behavior. That sense of the content has to keep going. We don't have time to stop and address this. And yet if we stopped and addressed it, everything else would go more smoothly yeah. But there's this sense of we don't have the time. There's this urgency that keeps you from slowing down to do that. That's great. So, uh, Kemi, over to you. All right. Oh, my goodness. There's just a lot of things that you've said, Jen, that are just resonate so very closely to me. Um, so thank you again for bringing that to light that we are not alone in um, when we have some of those challenges. Um, but there's obviously always those positives too. So are there some kind of um, like a framework or guideline that you might give to our audience with a, a little bit about how to kind of connect people and build the relationship and maybe put that sense of urgency to the side for a moment and prioritize. So is there something you can offer in that sense? What, what do you do? <laughs> um, are you thinking, Tammy, within your own building or beyond? Or uh, let's talk about both. <laughs> um, it's interesting. I, I spent my first 10 years of teaching, I spent in the upper grades in fourth and fifth grade at an elementary school that um, in that time grew to be almost to be about a thousand students, which was it's wow. pretty large for a K to five school. Um, and I realized after 10 years, I went to teach first grade and I realized how little I knew the teachers in the primary area of my school. In spite of the fact that we shared a building, we were on the, in the same physical yeah. space. Um, there were just so many of us and I had been so limited to those upper grade teachers. You know, I knew they taught there, but I couldn't have told you, is that a first grade teacher or a second grade teacher? Um, so I think one of the things is to, to make a concerted effort. And some of that needs to be a building support. There needs to be people in your building that take the take it on to sort of figure out how to get people together. Um, we often on teacher work days, we have a couple of teachers who will coordinate some kind of themed potluck so that we all come together and spend, even if it's just half an hour, eating a meal together. Um, yeah. Now, some teachers will spend that half an hour sitting with the people they already know, which makes sense to me because we get very little social time together. But I'll often try to search out people that I don't know as well, that I'd like to get to know a little bit better and have that social time to chat and kind of figure out what do we know about each other? What do we share? Um, I, I will often stop by classrooms in the mornings and just pop my head in and say, how's it going? You know, I don't know these people <laughs> in my current building. This is my fifth year. It took a couple of years before I really knew who everyone was. Um, but the only way to do that is to start reaching out. Um, yeah. And it doesn't really take, you know, people are by nature social, even right. even introverts, most of them, especially if you're in education where you're knowing you're spending your time with people, mm -hmm. most people are going to respond pretty well to having someone reach out and try to connect. And you can, you know, as soon as you've been somewhere for a year or two, you share kids, you know, I've got the older sibling or I had this student last year or and you can start connecting around students in a way that um, is really natural and lets you actually get to know people educationally and professionally in a way that social situations don't. It's a chance to, you know, if you're talking about a kid, you end up talking about what you believe about teaching and kids. Um, beyond the classroom, beyond your building, I actually think it's easier <laughs> to get to know people. I think it's really easy to, to just start following people on Twitter or to join groups on Facebook or um, and start looking for people that say things that connect with you, that, that really resonate with you. Um, 
there's so many people out there and there's so many different philosophies and beliefs and and ways of approaching things um but and and honestly i need to see people who aren't just like me but i also i'm with you tammy i need people who validate and reassure me that my reality and my challenges and my day-to-day -day life are worth what i'm doing and are working even when i don't feel they are so um the online world for me has been really helpful for that it helps to have colleagues in my building but it also helps to have this whole world beyond my building yeah right yeah. so I, I want to ask one thing tell me with your permission i, sure. I just got the question like yeah you you said the wonderful words there are people, very good people around us and we, we can be more social and everyone wants to be social now when i think of uh, multiple intelligence i wanted to ask one question do you think as a teacher or do uh, do you take uh, as a teacher leader these multiple intelligence as assets or as challenges <laughs> Can I say both? <laughs> as long so, as you have evidence to support your answers. Yeah, evidence. <laughs> evidence. The, I, I've had the opportunity in my teaching career to work with a lot of brand new teachers and pre-service teachers, teachers in their in their college, in their time of, of mostly in grad school, working towards their license. And it is fascinating to watch people as they develop at the beginning of a teaching career and see their strengths and see the begin to recognize that the things that I value about myself as a teacher are not what every teacher is going to do. Um, just as when I look at kids, they have different strengths and they're going to shine in different ways. Um, and I think as we think about teacher leadership, we have to be willing to look at teachers and find what is the area in which they are really strong, where there's their comfort level, um, and, you know, I, I have a couple of colleagues who are policy wonk kinds of teachers and they're great in the classroom. They're not going to talk to adults. They're never going to do professional development. They're not going to write in a way that for articles that most of us will read, they're going to write more academic. <laughs> um, but they're also going to, you know, analyze the, the bills that are up before the House and the Senate. And what does that actually mean for us in a way that I could never do? Um, the language of that, <laughs> it just doesn't, I need someone to hand that to me. Um, so I think there's a big piece of kind of figuring out what's the right path, especially around leadership for different people so that they can offer the most they have. And, and sometimes we see someone else doing something and think that looks great and try it. And it might not be where we really should be. Um, and so, yeah, finding it first and helping okay. other people begin to find that for themselves. Um, I mean, I'm not sure I'm really getting at what you're asking, but. <laughs> so, okay, okay, let, let yeah. me ask in this way. If, you, if, if the people come to you and they say that we want to become a teacher leader, what to do? I mean, how do you define teacher leadership? You want to, you, you should have some official designation, like you have to be some, you know, senior mistress, senior master, headmistress, headmaster. We have this kind of uh, hierarchy here, but obviously it varies from country to country. So do you, do you really first need to get some tag, official tag of uh, a teacher leader, or you can work in your capacity as a teacher leader? How, how do you look at it? I mean, I just want to see the teacher leadership through your lens. And I think there are formal teacher leadership opportunities. Um, right. My principal has been kind of pushing me in the direction of instructional coaching. That's what he thinks should be my next step. That is definitely within my district, a role of teacher leadership um, in our buildings. So there are some very formal ways becoming, um, you know, becoming a reading teacher or a math coach, the, the ways that then you, you are meeting with administration in your building and you are coaching teachers and supporting teachers. But I think there are a lot of really informal ways to become a teacher leader as well. And in some ways, I think those are more important because I think so often our formal teacher leadership opportunities take a teacher out of the classroom. And that's unfortunate, um, both because sometimes those are some of our best teachers and we've taken them out of the classroom. And I and we then they lose the day-to-day -day 
teaching experience that I think should be impacting the profession. I think at, at middle school or high school, there are opportunities to teach and lead in a way that aren't so true at elementary. You can teach two classes instead of five classes and have that other time in your professional day to do leadership things. That's harder to do at the elementary level where you're with the same kids all day. It's hard to, to kind of remove part of your responsibility and give you that opportunity. Um, and that's something I think that at least in the US, we really need to be looking at. How do we bring in people who are in the classroom every day, people who are doing the job of education, bring them into the leadership opportunities, be it in the building to be setting policy for your building, your district, your state, um, there, we need to look at, you know, look at our teacher work days, look at our, our spring breaks and summers. How do we start bringing teachers in and use those times so that they're not out of the classroom all the time trying to be involved in this? Because that's where we end up limiting actually having classroom teachers involved in leadership positions because they need to be with students. So we have to figure out how to make the structure of the system work to bring teachers to the table for all of those kinds of, of work. Right, over to you, Tammy. I totally agree with what you've just said, Jen. And I think um, if I were to run the education world, I know exactly what it would look like. Um, <laughs> unfortunately, I'm not allowed to do that. But um, I think that um, that structure change um, would be really valuable for students and um, teachers and administrators, because I think a lot of times we do think about how, you know, what's this person's official role, right? What are they? We look for what are they or who are they? What do they do? Um, but it's important that we, we're all still in the classroom so we know what's actually going on. So I think we've only got a few minutes left. Um, so probably what I would want to know from you that you can offer the viewers is what's your kind of tip, like a tagline you might be able to offer people for those who want to um, kind of emerge into a teacher leadership role? Ooh, a tagline. Um, or a tweet? <laughs> <laughs> right, get it into those characters. I, I would definitely say um, build your online network. One of, the, one of the difficulties is not even knowing what kind of opportunities are out there. Um, mm -hmm. and having a, a strong online network offers you the chance to see what you can and can't do um, beyond what you're already doing. Agreed. That's great. That's wonderful. Yes. So uh, uh, we are heading to Empower 19 yes. and you are going there, right? People are excited. So <laughs> yes, any people are really excited and uh, I will be missing you all there because I can't, I couldn't manage it this time. A lot of things going to have, are happening in Pakistan at the moment. But uh, teacher leadership is obviously a wonderful idea and a wonderful job and it requires. But the, the question is, when did you decide and what made you to decide to become a teacher leader? I'm not sure it was ever a conscious decision. Um, yeah. I, I think I, I started taking on roles outside of my classroom and I don't know that I would have defined myself as a teacher leader until several years into actually doing things that involve leadership. Um, again, I really think it stemmed from having a mentor in my administrator who encouraged me to do it, um, who recognized in me something that she thought was worth me stepping beyond my classroom um, and taking on those opportunities. And once I tried it, I, I love it, but I also love my classroom and I am trying to find that balance is, is where I am more than a decade later. <laughs> All right. So, can we go through a couple of comments that we have at the moment in the, yeah. In the show? Yeah. And uh, someone said this is enlightening. There's one question, uh, probably uh, from someone, stu some student, and the student says that what role do students have to play in the promotion of teacher leadership? Mm -hmm. and promote their role in teacher leadership. I mean, that is so. <laughs> that sounds good. Why we need student voices because too often it's easy for us to have conversations about education without really truly talking about them, um, yeah. and and they I, honestly, I'd even remove it from teacher leadership 
the kinds of things teachers need to be at the table for, we also need to have students at the table for, um, even maybe more than needing to have teachers as the ones who are sort of having this system imposed on them, they need to be involved in what the structure of the system and the choices that we're making. Um, so student voice is, and maybe this isn't true everywhere, maybe there are countries that are doing it better than the US, but we definitely do school to students and not with them. And we need to be doing it with them a whole lot more and bringing in their input. That's great, that's great. So we are done with today's shows and uh, it was fantastic having you. Tammy, you have to share something? Um, yeah, so at Empower, I'm gonna see Jen, which will be great. And uh, what I'll be doing during the conference is I'll be taking some clips um, so that Umer is gonna put together a video of uh, just a, a bunch of teacher leaders from the conference and then we'll have a nice special episode on the YouTube channel of Empower. So um, it'll be nice to get people to see kind of what goes on there, who's there, what we're talking about. And then um, in two weeks time, I'll be in New York and we'll probably do uh, the show from there. So that's that, wonderful. That's, that's, yeah. that's wonderful. You had to share some quote. Um, yeah, and you know, it's funny, uh, the one that I chose, Jen basically said earlier, um, a teacher, <laughs> yeah, it's a teacher leader thinks beyond the walls of their classroom to what yeah. uh, their impact can be. And so, and that's exactly what Jen was talking about today. So impacting in the classroom, but it goes way beyond what's happening in there too. Thank, Thank you very you. much, Tammy. Thank you, Jenny. And it was wonderful having you on board on the show. And uh, we are going to upload this uh, show on the YouTube channel. Do share with your friends and uh, we look forward to have more sessions in future with you. Tammy, over to you. Thanks for joining us, everyone. We will see you in two weeks, March 24th from New York. Yeah. Yeah. Jenny, you, you have to say anything? No, this was wonderful. Thank you both so much. Thank you very Thanks. much. Thank you.